pilgrim much today, we're coming to the deep things of God, and in a sense we need metaphorically to take our shoes off because we're standing on the holy ground. Well, the sermon divides itself rather neatly into two halves. First, we have our Lord's prediction of, of Peter's denial in verses 27 to 31. Uh, and I take it that this occurred as the, uh, Jesus and the apostles were walking from the city centre where the upper room was uh, out to the uh, Mount of Olives, uh, which is where Gethsemane is situated. And it's a distance of maybe half a mile, so a ten minute walk or thereabouts. And then secondly, we have our Lord's ordeal at Gethsemane. So the Lord Jesus' disciples are taking this short walk from the city uh, to the Mount of Olives, and the mood is darkening. And uh, Lee, when he spoke a couple of weeks ago, called the Last Supper a sombre <coughs> celebration, which is absolutely right. <clears throat> and there, as we saw, Jesus tells them that one of them would betray him. Well, that's bad enough, but he, as they walk on, he tells them that they're all going to fall away in just a moment or two. And then he will tell them that his leading disciple is going to betray him three times. And the Lord Jesus has always known uh, how his public ministry would end. The cross was always before him. And three times he told his disciples about it. And uh, three times uh, they, they didn't get it. Um, they, they just didn't understand. Uh, in, in chapter 8, verse 31, and then nine, chapter 9, verse 31 to 32. And he tells them, um, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They'll kill him. After three days he will rise. They didn't understand what he meant, and they were afraid to ask him about it. And they, they just seemed to have just gl glossed over it and got on with their, their petty arguments about who was going to be top dog in the kingdom of God. Uh, and the time of his suffering is getting closer and closer, coming in on him. It's like some slow goods train drawing nearer and nearer and nearer. First of all, it was, it was maybe uh, 30 years away. And then it's three years away as he starts his ministry. And then it's a year away. And then a week away. And now it is right in front of him. Just an hour or two away. And the reality of it is staring him in the face. And how saddened he must have been to think that those men whom he has loved and, and lived with and taught and led and cared for and nurtured them for three years were all going to collapse like a house of cards uh, when the, the time of testing comes. Yet still, he loves them. And yet, again, all this had been prophesied three or five hundred years before the event. If you want proof that the Bible is the inspired word of God, here you are. It's in Zechariah, where the, uh, the prophet says, Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. And then the Lord gives the apostles a great big clue. Verse 28, After I've risen... I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And why, did, why didn't they catch hold of this? Because after the crucifixion, they're absolutely downcast. Remember the disciples on the, on the road to Emmaus. They said, we had thought, plus perfect tense, we had thought he, he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. But it's not going to happen now, it's all over. You've got to fold up the tent, put away the sign, it's all finished, it's done, it's over. And all the time, they should have been putting out the bunting, shouldn't they, for, 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 uh, for, for Easter Sunday. But they don't get it. And I think there's a lesson for us here, a little bit of application right at this point. Things look pretty bad for the church, in Britain at least, in these days. And um, it's looking rough, but we, we are the people who have read to the end of the book. And we do know one thing, and that thing is Jesus is going to win. And therefore we press on. Therefore we persevere. Despite whatever we might receive in the way of mocking or pitying looks, uh, that may come our way. And it won't happen in our lifetime. It may not happen in our lifetime. Who knows? But we do know one thing. Jesus is going to win. And the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. But Peter won't have any of this. He says, even if all fall away, I will not. He says, my, my love is stronger. My faith is deeper. My obedience is greater. Even if these all fall away, I will not fall away. And Peter has, Peter has form on this. If you go back to uh, Mark 6, verse 45, they see Jesus walking on the water towards them. And Peter says, If it's you, Lord, tell me to come to you on the water. 
And Jesus says, come on then. And he walks out and it's all going great. And he's looking at Jesus and it's all fine. And then suddenly he sees the waves and he remembered what he learned at Galilee High School that a body displaces its own body in the water. <laughs> and all of a sudden he's beginning to sing, help me Lord. And Jesus picks him up, you have little faith, why did you doubt? Great start. Not quite such a great finish. And then, a little bit later on, Jesus asks them, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah. Who do you say I am? And up goes Peter's hand straight away. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Wonderful. But a little bit later, when he starts to say, uh, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men and killed and so forth. He says, excuse me, Lord, just a little word in your ear here. We don't want any of this defeatist talk around here. Messiahs, messiahs don't die, they conquer. Come on. Great start. Pretty dreadful finish. And now we have this here. Even if all fall away, I will not fall away. And yet just, just, just a very short time, an hour or two later, he said, I tell you, I don't know the man. Great start. Absolutely catastrophic finish. So we ask ourselves, is it possible for a man like this to be restored to leadership? Maybe brought into the congregation to sit at the back. But can he, can he not prove himself to be utterly unsuitable for leadership? Well, not at all. Uh, if you'd like to turn, if, if you feel disposed, you might like to turn to John uh, chapter uh, 21 and verse 15. Uh, three times Jesus has denied, uh, sorry, Peter has denied his Lord. And three times the Lord asked him, Simon, son of Peter, do you love me? And the first time, the first time he asked says, do you truly love me more than these? And Peter's mind would have gone back to what he'd said in the garden and he would have been horrified to think that he had uh, said these things and he had to run away. And it twice more he asks him, Peter, son of John, do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter doesn't know what to say. And all, all he can do, all he can do is say, is appeal to our Lord's omniscience, omniscience. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But you see, Jesus doesn't say to him, well, Peter, you've done a dreadful thing here. Can you give me an absolute assurance that nothing of this sort will ever happen again? No, he just asked him that question. Peter, son of John, do you love me? And then he says to him, feed my sheep. And then in verse 19 there, he says, follow me. So here we have two criteria for the restitution of anyone who, who, who fails the Lord Jesus. And all of us will at some time. Do we love him? Will we follow him? In Peter's case, to follow him all the way to execution. Do we love him? Will we follow him? Now, there are some sins which make it more difficult for a church leader to be restored immediately. And uh, 1 Timothy 5 verse 20 says uh, that a leader who falls into sin is to be rebuked publicly from the pulpit here. Uh, and a wise Puritan once said that, that uh, restitution to leadership can only happen when uh, a sinner's repentance becomes as well known as his fall into sin. So now, the Lord of Jesus and his 11 remaining apostles come to Gethsemane, which is the place of the olive press. And eight of the disciples, he seems to leave uh, perhaps at the gate to keep watch. And he goes on uh, only with Peter and James and John. And then it was great. He says, look, chaps, don't worry about all this. It's all going to be fine. Father's going to be with me every step of the way. And we'll just do this and get it over the with. And then we'll get the show rolling on Easter, Mon Easter, Easter Monday. And he did 20 press-ups. He jumped up, gave him a high five, and off he went. <laughs> no, no, no. He began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed. With sorrow to the point of death, he says. Can this really be our Lord and Saviour? Horrified and bewildered almost at the things which are coming upon him? Yes, yes it can. Yes it can. How did, how did it happen that Jesus Christ, who is God, is horrified by these things and shocked? 
we have to understand the two natures of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is both God and man. He is 100% man and 100% God, not 50% of each. And the best way to understand this is to think that he is man as if he were not God, but God as if he were not man. And the best place to look at this is Mark chapter 4. You need to turn to it now, but the stilling of the storm. And Jesus comes on board the boat, and what happens? He's tired. And he lies down on the pillow and he goes to sleep. He's tired. Well, if you turn to Isaiah 40, it will tell you, with, without any shadow of a doubt, that uh, uh, he, uh, 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 God does not get tired. God does not get tired or weary. But Jesus was tired. He was a man, as if he were not God. Elsewhere he gets tired and hungry and thirsty, and he weeps at Lazarus' grave. He's a man with human frailty, as if he were not God. But what happens then? Just a few minutes later, uh, the, the, storm, the storm breaks, and the disciples come to him, and he stands up and he rebukes the wind and the waves. He doesn't pray to the Father, please, uh, please let this storm pass. He, he himself rebukes the wind and the waves, and there is a great calm. He is God. He is God as though he were not man. Secondly, the Lord Jesus knew exactly what was coming upon him. He couldn't deceive himself with the thought that maybe things wouldn't be that bad, that, that maybe the Jewish leaders would just beat him up a bit and let him go, or, or that the Romans would come and free him, or that the disciples would mount a, 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 some sort of rescue. He knew exactly what was coming to him, and it was starting right now. And uh, we can look at Isaiah 53, uh, Ian read this earlier, but we'll bear, uh, bear reading again, I think. Isaiah 53 and uh, um, verses 5 to 6. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are, fear, are healed. We, all like sheep, gone astray. Each of us has turned in his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All of the sins of God's people were laid upon him. And Peter tells us, uh, 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He bore the, the, our sins were laid upon them, he bore them, he carried them to the cross. And why does Peter say he bore them on the tree and not the cross? Because there is a curse. Cursed is everyone who is left hanging on a tree. He bore the curse of our sins, as well as just the burden of them. And he bore them, he expiated it. And again, 1 Corinthians 5, 21, he was, <coughs> God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. He was made the very epitome of sin. And we don't really know what this, all this means, but maybe right now he began to feel this awful burden of the sins of all God's people pressing in upon him. And it was a totally alien feeling to him. For, for, for one who was entirely sinless. And worst of all, he knew that on the cross, he was going to be entirely alone. We read in, uh, in, in Habakkuk, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 13. Habakkuk speaking to God, Your eyes are too pure to look upon evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. And when the Lord Jesus was made sin, when the God-man was made sin, the very epitome of sin, God the Father turned away. And Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now one of the features of hell, as I understand it, is uh, that uh, is a total absence of God, save for his abiding wrath. And uh, in 2 Thessalonians uh, Great, uh, we read um, of, of sinners. They will be punished with everlasting destruction, shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified and so forth. That is what the Lord Jesus Christ was going to experience. He was going to experience total desolation, total absence from the Father, the, the closest, of, closest of relationship that he enjoyed all through his life and it was going, uh, it was going to be broken for a period. And he experienced hell for us that we will not have to. And it was this prospect, I believe, that weighed 
so heavily upon him. Thirdly, I believe there was another satanic attack. We read in Luke 4 verse 13, talking about our Lord's temptation in the wilderness. We read, we read uh, that uh, um, the devil left him for an opportune time. But if ever there was an opportune time for Satan to attack him, it was now. And again in John 14 verse 30, he says, the prince of this world is coming. He knew again what was coming upon him. The prince of this world was coming and now he was there. This was the opportune time Satan had been waiting for. And he was saying that you don't have to go through this. You are of equal deity to the Father. Tell him you won't do it. There has to be another way. Listen to me and we'll sort something out so you won't have to go through this. Now, I'm quite sure that it was impossible for Christ as God to yield to temptation. But as man... He could be tempted. And if you, if you were to heat up pure gold to 500 degrees centigrade, you would still not get any impurities out of it. But that wouldn't make the heat any the less. And the Lord Jesus could not do the one thing that we can do when we are suffering from temptation that we think is overwhelming, we think is intolerable, we can give in to it. And that was the one thing the Lord Jesus could not do. And that uh, is why, of course, we should avoid getting into uh, situations where we may be tempted and why we pray, lead us not into temptation. And uh, uh, Timothy uh, has, uh, Paul has some wise words to give to, uh, uh, to Timothy on this. Uh, he, says, he says to him, avoid Godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more unlucky. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith and love. And it's not only the, uh, the, the youth who get evil desires. Don't have anything to do with stupid and foolish arguments. Keep away, he said, keep away from temptation. Anything that might lead you into sin to be tempted, keep away from it. But the Lord Jesus had to go through it. He had to stand firm. Contrary to what one reads in some places, Satan was desperate that Jesus should not go to the cross. Why? Because Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And when our Lord took away the sins, our sins on the cross, Satan was defeated. We have nothing to accuse God's people of now. But our sins are taken away. And the Lord looks upon us as perfectly righteous in Christ Jesus. Satan has nothing to accuse him of. Now we can maybe discuss this tonight, but I believe this is the meaning of Revelation 12, where we're told that the accuser of the brethren is cast down. Uh, have a read of it this afternoon of your homework, if you like. So, <coughs> faced with this terrible distress and turmoil, the Lord Jesus does what we should all do when facing great ordeals. He prays. And... Uh, Many years ago, I bought an Elvis record, um, and on the, on the B side was crying in the chapel, and it says, take your troubles to the chapel, get down on your knees and pray, and your burden will be lightened, and you'll surely find the way. I don't know why I remember that after about 50 years, but I do. And it's good advice. So um, in verse... Uh, Verse 33, he takes Peter, James and John along with him. He wanted his closest friends near him. <coughs> but at the same time, he needed to be alone with the Father. So he says to them, stay here and keep watch. And he went just a little further and prayed. And note that although he asks now, he prays, Abba Father, everything is possible for you take this cup away from me. Yet he is utterly submissive to the Father's will. Yet not as I will, but as you will. There is a, just that wondering, perhaps, whether there might not be a plan B somewhere, but uh, he is determined to pursue the Father's will. And in Philippians 2, we read that though he was in very nature God, yet he did not make his uh, deity something to be grasped, something to be held on to, but he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. He became the suffering servant of his father. 
not as I will, but as you will. But what is his hour? When he speaks about an hour, doesn't he? He talks about an hour. Um, take this hour. Um, he prayed that if possible the hour might pass from him. It's a time. It's a certain set time. And uh, as I said um, earlier, he knew this time was coming upon him. It was rolling slowly down the road towards him. And uh, he knew that uh, very soon he must face this thing. And in John 20, uh, jo sorry, John 12, and verse, uh, verse 23, Jesus said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. It is that time which he always knew was there, always knew was coming, and at one point he realised that it was here, it was come upon him, it was now. And we read again uh, in John 13, verse 1, just before the fast over the feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. The hour had come to him. He was come and he had to go through it. The hour is not a literal 60 minutes. It's, it's a period of time that he had always known was coming before him. And how about the cup? What's the cup about? Everything is possible for you, he says. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Well, the cup, the cup is, is a cup of God's judgment and wrath that come upon this world and those who dwell upon it. God's wrath. If you go to Psalm 75 and verse 8, we, we read, um, in the Lord's hands there is a cup and, it is, and though the wicked will drink it down to the dregs. It's a cup of God's judgment. And it's coming. And it's a cup that Jesus must drink right down to the dregs. So that we will not have to. You can find the cup. It's, it's Psalm 60. It's described as a cup of confusion that comes upon the world. But it's also in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, in Habakkuk. There's all the same thing. The cup. A cup of God's judgment coming upon the world. And Jesus must drink it on behalf of his people. And he'll drink it right down to the dregs the people that God has given. All the confusion, the horror, the suffering that would otherwise come upon us has come upon him. The cup could not pass if his people were to be redeemed. He had to go through it. And we must be clear on this, dear ones. We, we, must, be, we must be clear that he had to go through these things. That he had to suffer, that we should not suffer. That it is, the, the official term is penal substitution. He took the punishment that we should, we should, we deserved, and all our sins laid upon him, him to take the punishment, so that all his perfect righteousness and obedience can be credited to us. Most important. Now, in Luke's gospel, we read that an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And perhaps Peter, James, and or John perhaps looked up at some point, uh, woke up and looked across and saw the Lord Jesus with the angel perhaps ministering to him. There would be no such angel in Calvary. But that will do, he's got a face on his own. But I wonder, I, when I get to heaven, I, I, one of the things I want to do is find this angel and ask him what he actually did. Because whatever it was, it didn't make all the bad stuff go away. Because we read, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Is it actual blood or, 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 or like blood or as it were blood? Most commentators seem to think it was real and there is a, a condition, a medical condition, um, when under colossal pressure sweat can actually become bloody. You have to ask Sower about it because uh, I know them more than that. But whatever the case, the fact is that at a time when it was cold enough for them to light a fire in the high priest's courtyard. Our Lord sweats copiously. The psychosomatic response of a human being to impending trauma. Why, why is this important for us to know? Because we know that whatever pressures, whatever anxieties, whatever griefs, whatever failures, whatever betrayals we may be facing today, the Lord Jesus has faced them and he has come through them. 
We're going nowhere that he has not already gone. And in Hebrews chapter 4, I spoke on this about a year ago, I think, uh, verse 14, 15. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we, possess, we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted, tested in every way, just as we are, yet who was without sin. So when we pray, when we say, oh God, I'm feeling so, so, so hopeless, so helpless, so depressed, so down, so betrayed, so useless, whatever it may be. God is not saying to us, well, frankly, I can't really associate myself with this because it's great up in heaven and uh, I don't really understand what you're talking about. No, no, Jesus Christ has been there. He has suffered all these things. Our great high priest knows exactly what it is like to suffer all these things. And he uh, knows what it's like to be horrified at what is coming upon him. So, we read, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. So, at some point, the Lord Jesus gets up and he goes to his disciples and his friends for comfort, but he finds none. They're fast asleep. But he doesn't prevent his stress upon them. He gives them a mild rebuke and warns them to stay alert so that they will not fall into temptation. Now, had they done so, they would have been better prepared for when Judas and the mob uh, descend on them in just a short uh, period of time. But it's important for us as well to take this, to be alert, always, to stay alert and be ready for whatever temptation may come upon us so that we can get out of the way of it and avoid it, as I said earlier. We need to be alert. We need to keep watch and wait and not be sleeping. But, he just recognised the weakness of their human frames, didn't he? Uh, Luke tells us that they were sleeping from sorrow. For the Lord Jesus returns to prayer. And when he arises again, the disciples are back asleep. But the Lord Jesus is ready. His time with his Father has strengthened him. And all through his trials and all through his beatings, he is totally in command of himself and the situation. So let's just uh, look a little bit of uh, application now. So, in time of stress, pray. The next slide's up. That would be great. Thank you. Oh, yes. Just pray. By all means, ask one of the leaders to, to pray with you. And then, God willing, we won't fall asleep halfway through. But, chiefly, Pray yourself and understand that God understands. God knows your needs even before you ask. And though he may not, he may not possibly answer your prayers in just the way you want, as he didn't answer the Lord Jesus' prayer, he will not let you be tested more than you can bear. So we go back to uh, our, our text for the year, James 4 and verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Secondly, understand the human nature of Christ. Don't think of him as someone removed from all your troubles. He knows what it is to suffer, to struggle, to be betrayed, to come face to face with agony and pain, and to come through it all. And he will bring you through. He will bring you through if you will put your trust in him. There's a lovely verse in, uh, in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 10. Who amongst you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? I hope that's all of us. Let him who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. When things look black, when things are most difficult, maybe you feel your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling. Trust in him. Trust in him. Keep praying. Keep trusting. And he will see you through. And finally, adore Christ. Understand that it was for you that he suffered these things. And there was no compulsion on him to do so, save love and grace and mercy towards sinners like you and me. And we should be praising him, and we should be living lives that are worthy of him, and we should be thanking him daily for all that he has done, and we should be seeking 
to serve him, as the Graham Kendrick song said, uh, uh, constantly. There was a chap uh, at the end of the last century, into this, uh, the end of the 19th century, into the 20th century, called C.T. Studd, who was a test cricketer <coughs> and a millionaire. And he gave it all up, <coughs> gave away all his money to serve Christ in China, in India, and finally in Africa. And he said, if Jesus Christ be God, who died for me, then no sacrifice <coughs> would be too great for me to give to him. That be our watchword. Amen.